Um, so my name is Darren Wood. I, I work for Objectivity, uh, and primarily, obviously, I work on a, a product called Infinite Graph, which is a graph database. Um, and I'm going to run through some introdu introductory stuff to both graph databases and the, the product Infinite Graph. Uh, and then we also have a little bit of a preview because we're about to beta release uh, 3.0 of Infinite Graph, so we've got some previews of the features that are coming down the line in, uh, in that as well. And so, uh, so I'll talk through some of those things at the back of this. So it's interesting because I do give this presentation of you know it's sort of different types of conferences. Not all of them specialise on NoSQL. So um, you know this slide's all really about sort of trying to explain what NoSQL is. Um, and, and I guess I don't need to do that as much in, in, in an audience like this because everybody who's coming to this conference obviously is, is very much interested in alternative database solutions and, and they're looking for their data specialists. So you know, obviously NoSQL is all about uh, you know, specializing in, in some kind of uh, you know, database uh, set of requirements. That's, that's essentially what it is. So you know, in, the, in the early days of NoSQL, when people were essentially building their own NoSQL database, and when I say early days, this has been going on forever. Um, you know, essentially what they were doing was saying, well, you know, off-the-shelf databases don't really provide what we need from a database, right? Because they have rules and constraints, or you know, the way that they uh, represent themselves to the user doesn't exactly meet their requirements. So and that, that could be for a number of different reasons. It could be it's not storing the data in a way that makes it you know, performant for me to get that data back. So you know, I'm, not, I'm not able to read the data fast enough. Um, you know, there might be uh, you know, some, some constraints around the way the transactions are managed in that type of database that makes you know, locking uh, come into play and, and cause applications to wait on each other. And you know, certain types of applications don't want to do that. Um, so NoSQL databases essentially break down you know, some of the, the, uh, the main goals of building a database and specialize in certain, you know, in certain types of data or certain types of behavior in the database. And graph databases are no different. So it's really strange because you know, for so long, uh, relational databases have been so pervasive, uh, whereas you know, we specialize in, in every other aspect of our life. So this is essentially just uh, specializing in data. And that's, that's kind of what NoSQL is. So, for a graph database, of course, you know we specialize in the storage of graph data. So, you know, what, is, what does that exactly mean? So, this this whole you know rise of NoSQL databases and and you know many of them have been around for a long time, in fact, and, and have just sort of become popular or you know people have started to see the benefits of them. But it's it's sort of given rise to these types of polyglot type you know, NoSQL architectures where you're mixing multiple databases together, you're taking the strengths of each one, you're storing the type of data that best suits that database into, you know, into its particular flavor of NoSQL database. So, you know, you might have something at the front end, so this might be a, you know, a web scale type application that is serving your users directly and you need a certain type of database for that because you need to be able to, you know, show them their profile information, you need to be able to scale reads and writes to that information really well. Uh, so you might be storing that in a certain way. But then you've got things in the back end, you know, you might be using Hadoop or MapReduce or something, or MapReduce on top of Hadoop, um, you know, to do sort of large scale crunching of numbers or crunching of user data to try and figure out something about your user that might, you know, make it easy to market to them in some way or something like that. And then you're taking the output of that and storing it in another type of data store that, that is good for querying that data, right? So you're, you're kind of taking, you know, reams of data that you're getting from your users or from your users' behavior or from things they're doing on the web, and you're putting them into a, you know, a massively scalable you know, big data store. You're crunching that information down, and the stuff that's coming out the other end, you know, is all different kinds of data that can be stored in different kinds of ways to make it really performant um, in terms of, uh, you know, query, uh, query performance, so make it easy to, to get that information back. So, of course, relational databases are still really good for some aspects of that. Um, and you know, you've got the other style of NoSQL databases document, and of course, I'm going to focus mostly on the graph database, which is when you can, you know, you can see the problem or see the type of data you're looking to store as a graph, and it becomes useful to do traversal style queries in that data. A uh, graph database is a really good choice. So, you know, becoming a specialist, a specialist type of database, what does it really mean? I mean, what are you doing? Are you just sort of putting some API on top of a relational database and then saying, well, can't you see, you know, we presented this data as some other format and some other way to you. Um, so, you know, now we're a graph database. 
know, we're a specialist type of database. Well, that's actually not what it means. I mean, becoming a true specialist in the database area means going all the way to the way that the data is physically stored and optimizing it around that use case, okay? So as I just explained, you know, queries in a graph database often involve traversal of relationships in the data. So that's pretty straightforward. So, you know, this is a really simplified slide, you know, really high level slide that sort of shows the way a piece of data about some relationships between people, this is phone call records, might be stored in a relational database versus how it would be stored in a graph database like Infinite Graph. Um, and here you've got essentially the list of phone calls for everybody in the system in a big table in the relational database. And of course what that means is, you know, as the number of people in the database grows, the number of calls they're making grows, the size of this table is going to continue to grow. Right? It's going to be a giant big table. And for me to find the phone calls that Bob has made, I have to go through this giant big table and I have to filter on, you know, this column here. So, you know, who made this call? And of course I can use indexes to speed it up and I can partition this table and I can do all kinds of fancy stuff. But at the end of the day, if, you, if it's really, if that's what you want to do in your query, go into the Bob node and look at the phone calls that just Bob has made and see who they're being made to, you're much better storing it that way. And that's how a graph database stores its data. Okay, so it basically stores the physical entities in the, in the database as vertexes and it stores the relationships between that vertex and other things in the database you know, in a very compact performant way so we can get that back and we can traverse those relationships super fast. So the traversal of these relationships is what a graph database is all about. Okay. So that's the main goal. And I think this is kind of a really fundamental slide to introducing graph databases. So, you know, you'll see uh, a bunch of the graph database vendors doing similar slides like this. And this is true, I mean, we took a bunch of relational databases and like I said, as, as the number of nodes in the graph increases and the number of connections between the nodes in the graph increase, relational databases do have this asymptotic sort of fall down in the way that you can traverse that data. Okay? So you can implement a graph database in a relational database. But here's a couple of you know, different sort of open source and commercial RDBMSs that we ran some benchmarks <laughs> against. Um, and of course, it's very easy for a graph database to win because you know, this, this test is essentially going into a node and saying, now traverse out to all the things that surround this node. And of course, that's what we store at that node. We don't have to go through everybody else's uh, relationships and filter them out or you know, use any kind of, any kind of uh, you know, reading these giant tables and filtering through them. We don't have to do any of that. So we have a, an advantage, and that, that describes what our advantage is in, in, for this particular type of query, and that's, that's the specialist part. So, you know, when, when you start talking about NoSQL databases, everybody wants to know, well, you know, how do you scale your writes, how do you scale your reads, you know, how does your distribution work, how do you, you know, scale out horizontally and, and, and make things faster. And, and there's a number of different aspects to that, okay. So, obviously there is, you know, there is partitioning, so you can basically set up your database so it's, it's partitioned across, you know, some series of machines or hosts in the cloud or whatever. And then, essentially what you do is you get the ability to write to multiple places, so you've got more machines, more servers, uh, more CPU, it's actually processing those, uh, those queries of those writes. Um, and that's true, so that's, that's, that's one way. But then you start running into you know, understanding what your consistency requirements are. I know a bunch of you have probably been to dozens of presentations on consistency and, and, uh, and the trade-offs in NoSQL around. Um, and I think that some of the best NoSQL databases give you options and choices around that at the API level. So what they say is, you know, if I have a, a node in my graph and I need to update that node, uh, for example, if I want to add two edges to it, an edge between this node and two other things in the graph, you know, that node in the middle is, is a point of locking, it's a point of contention. So do I, you know, can I do that in a way that locks other things from changing it so I get a consistent, you know, move from one state to another? Or can I feed that information in, into the graph somehow and let the database sort out how that's done? And it will be eventually consistent. So over time, you know, that graph will build up in the background. Uh, and Infinite Graph has ways to, you know, to allow you to do that. That's what these slides describe here. So again, very simple example. You've got three nodes in your graph, two edges you want to put in. The guy in the middle, if I have two applications, one adding this edge and one adding that edge, do I want the two applications to wait? Or do I want them to be able to add the edge into the database? So, you know, quite common in, you know, NoSQL type deployments and, and certainly in the, the prospects that we see, you've got applications that are just streaming data in from all these different sources. You've got phone call data coming in here, you've got intelligence data coming in over here. 
not all these applications want to just sit there and lock on every individual node that they want to update. And so we allow you to break that down in infinite graphs so you can do something we call pipelining, so you can push edges in, and the graph builds in the background. We take care of that. Um, of course, when you do a read, you're reading you know, a consistent state of the database, but these edges are being added in the background for you, so they're being, the graph's being built um, in an eventually consistent way. So you know, that's one way that we scale writes, specifically scaling edge writes in uh, um, and this is probably way too detailed. This is part of the architecture that's, that you know, this is built on. We have you know, this ability to deploy agents into the, into the database to actually do this processing in the background. So we have a, a database server as, as such that can run on multiple hosts and it's horizontally scalable. And your clients are just forcing data in and building the graph up in the background. You don't have to wait. However, we do have a fully acid mode, right? So again, choice. Choice is really important. So if you want to take uh, an application and say, no, I need to lock, you know, add this edge because another application might not see that edge and I want to have, you know, this atomic update to the, the database, um, you can go back into that mode. We do that at the API level, we'll give you the choice. Right? Very important. So of course, trade-offs, as I just explained, you know, you see a very high perceived ingest rate. So as your data is arriving, you can just add nodes, add edges, you know, connect edges up in the graph. So your clients are not blocked doing that. They go straight into the database. However, you know, the trade-off is consistency, right? So as you're doing a navigation, you may not necessarily see the edge that was added, you know, by an application a couple of milliseconds ago. All right, but the important thing here is choice. And of course the result is this, you know, a very nicely sort of horizontal <coughs> scalable ability to push data into the database. And this is some graph made out of some of our uh, performance testing on pretty modest hardware in, in the office in a, in a raid, oh, sorry, a rack of, or an array of uh, machines in racks. So, with the consistency, is that like an all or nothing thing or is that kind of per application? No, yeah, so it's actually per transaction. Per so yeah, so when you start the transaction, you can decide that that transaction is going to start locking stuff, right? And then you know you can start a different type of transaction that says, you know what, this goes in, and when it can get in around all the locks that the other transactions are taking to do it. So they can help you from grabbing data off of the you know biometric device or something like that. That can be eventually the system device. Exactly. Work. Yeah, uh, that's so right. Maybe something coming in from uh, another transaction. Yeah, and that actual use case is is a really good one because. Quite often those devices, and we've seen this before, they, they operate in burst, right? Yeah, yeah. So they say, we do an experiment, and then it just a ton of data comes down, and we just want to get it in. You know, yeah. just want to push it in. We don't want to be locking and waiting for clients and things like that, so just push it in. And this will then process, reprocess in the background. And then, you know, so you've got this sort of very, you know, jumpy sort of ingest rate, right? Where you want to push a bunch of stuff in, then there's nothing, and then push a bunch of stuff in, and this works really well for that. So scaling reads and query, okay, so, you know, in a lot of cases, you know, especially in sort of the key value space and, and, and whatnot, and, you know, in other, in relational databases as well, it's, it's relatively simple to replicate and scale reads, okay, so you can make replicas of the data, they might not be consistent replicas, but you can make replicas of the data, you can push out read replicas, you know, update them as, you know, as necessary in the background. Um, and that's pretty easy for a, uh, you know, for a key value store or a relational database, you know, partitioning tables, partitioning uh, key space in key value stores, in document databases as well, partitioning key space for the documents. Uh, relatively easy to do. With a graph, it's a bit different because graphs look like this. Okay, so, you know, graph data is just all connected to each other. So, it's a bit of a mess and, of course, the result of a query might look like this, right? So you're actually getting pieces of a result from various partitions in the database, right? Which means that it's not as easy to sort of just say, well, I'm just going to slice this data up and I'm going to send all the queries that go for that partition of the data down to this server, and it's replicas perhaps, you know, so you might have a partition and then replicas of that partition. It's much easier to do that. Uh, in a graph, it's, it's quite a bit more difficult. So there's a bunch of solutions to this. So some of you may have read about Cradle. Um, and Pragle sort of turns the whole problem upside down. So what it says, it says, look, in the graph what we're going to do is we're going to store a bunch of nodes, you know, sort of partition across the data set, and you're going to have all the nodes laid out in their partitions. Every time we want to do part of a traversal from one node to another, what we'll do is we'll wrap up the context of that navigation 
and we'll send that to the, the home of the node where it's going, right? So we'll follow, essentially we follow these relationships like I've shown here, we sort of follow them using messaging between the processes on each host, right? That's a novel solution. It really simplifies you know, processing queries in the graph database. I mean, it boils it down to essentially, as a processor, and all I have to do is wind the handle and all the messages coming in from my, my host comes in, it says I'm going here, it does some evaluation, looks at the context, looks at the rules of the traversal, and then it says, where am I going next? And so if I'm going here, then I still wrap up a message, you know, and I send it to myself. You know, it goes back in the queue and the process is just winding this queue. If I'm going over there, then I send a message to that guy. It simplifies, you know, graph traversal. So it's a novel idea. But one of the problems with Pragle is that it does exactly that. I mean, it simplifies it. So all this context wrapping, you know, this sending of messages either to each other or to itself is quite expensive. Like, I mean, you've got, you know, you have to format the data and you have to have ways to do that. And there's only so much you can put in there and, you know, there's rules around that. And so it's restrictive and it can be quite expensive, especially when it's on the local host. So if you had cash here that had all these nodes in here and you're constantly wrapping messages up and sending it to itself, you're sort of wrapping and unwrapping for no reason. Right? So, but it's simple, right? And simple is, for the most part, good. And the second one here is kind of like a distributed caching model. So what you do is you kind of take, you know, this same sort of architecture, but what you do is you bring pieces of the graph that are commonly used with each other into cache on, you know, the various processes. Right? So what you end up with is, is like sort of pieces of the graph stored in memory that, you know, Sometimes there's overlap, so you might store some of this over here in memory, and so you come up with this kind of you know distributed caching. Um, and Infinite Graph was doing this, um, so this is kind of the approach that Infinite Graph was using. But we've started to head down a path which I think is uh, even better. So with Infinite Graph now, um, and and some of this is being introduced into into the new release in version three and the beta that'll be coming out soon. We're, doing, we're making decisions about that. So we can still send pieces of a query to the host where the majority of that data lives. Um, but we can also process some hops of the query in memory in our cache. Because actually when we do a, a, a traversal in memory in our cache, it's actually two C++ objects sitting in a piece of heap space and the connection is actually a pointer. Um, so hopping across that is you know, so much faster than trying to wrap a message up or sending it. Thing. So, and we also have really good statistics and really good data about what's in our cache, and so we know things about what's going on. So, this is the direction that we're heading with the Infinite Graph, you know, making very smart choices about you know, when we need to distribute a piece of the traversal and send it off to a location that's more apt at processing that piece of the, the, the navigation versus doing it in memory in our cache. And of course, this is you know, fully flexible around how much cash you've allocated because if you've got more cash and you've allocated plenty of cash on the host and we can bring it in and we can keep it there and we're getting a lot of, you know, misses by going out to another host and bring it in, you know, and bring it in, that's fine. But there's a limit to that, so that's when you want a system that's kind of a hybrid that can do both. Okay. Uh, so this, this whole schema thing, especially in a NoSQL concept, uh, um, conference, is going to be uh, a tough one to debate <laughs> because you know, uh, I'd say at least 90% of NoSQL databases um, kind of favour the, the concept of a schemaless database. Right? So, um, so the whole schema versus schemaless debate, I'm sure it's happening out in the hallway, you know, a thousand times an hour, and it's very, data, you know, it's very religion based. You know, it's almost database religion. Um, so, I don't really have time for a full debate about it here, except just to show you that. You know, we have a couple of use cases and again a couple of things that are coming out in IG3 um, that I think are very compelling reasons to have a schema in your graph database. Okay, so, um, so I'll, I'll sort of go through those. Having said that, we're also planning it, you know, to have document style data nodes as well. So essentially, you know, a schemaless data node. But again, we're very big on choice. I mean, you know, one of our real sort of mandates in Infinite Graph is, is to offer choice, right? So you can use schema for the parts of your data where that makes sense or use, you know, a schemaless sort of document node where you'd rather have the flexibility. So it's just trade-offs, right? There's flexibility, it's great until it gets out of control and then you have no idea what the shape of your objects are. And so everybody knows the two sides of the argument. We're sort of hoping <coughs> to give some choice so you can, you know, flip flop between them. Um, and you can mix them actually in, in, in your data source. 
But uh, so here's one, and I know the side's kind of bland, um, I went for the, the one color scheme here. But these are essentially, you know, think about this like classes in your graph, right? And, and this is an example from a real, um, I had to sort of take some things out. But anyway, there's, there's about 200 classes in, this, in the real system that this represents. And so I was trying to scale it down to some, you know, set of classes that, um, that make sense, right? That still have some good uh, examples for traversals and navigations. So this is obviously healthcare data, right? So it's actually reasonably simple to represent healthcare data as a graph. And um, you know, I, I can tell you a lot of uh, the healthcare data people and healthcare organisations themselves are looking at graph databases to, um, to store healthcare data because it makes sense, right? And there's a lot of there's a lot of types of queries you want to do in healthcare data um, that work really well on the graph. They work really well as traversals. So. Now, this is pretty straightforward. I'll sort of run through this. You've got a patient. They have a, a visit with a physician, right? And this visit might be a location or something. There's lots of different things that can go into this graph. Sometimes there's outcomes on those visits. So they have this kind of concept of you know, something that happens there, like they've diagnosed you with something or other. Um, and in this case, we have an allergy um, as a, an outcome, right? Now, this could be a giant class IRF. I mean, this could be a very, very rich series of outcomes, right? Outcome is the base class. That's the type of thing that a visit can have connected to it, but you've got you know, all kinds of outcomes, right? You can just keep adding them. And they, you know, healthcare organizations like that because we're always finding new things that are wrong with people, and you know, so they like to be able to extend the set. So this is, this is a big class hierarchy with hundreds of classes in it. But I've shown the allergy one for one reason, it's because I want to make an example of it. So let's say you're at the patient and you're about to prescribe them a drug, and that drug, you know, it's the doctor doesn't really know a lot about the patient necessarily. They might have come from somewhere else. They might have been treated in another facility or whatever. So they've got a bunch of you know, pre-existing prescriptions, but they've also got allergies to things. So right, how does the doctor know, you know what drugs are OK to give people? And apparently, this is actually really dangerous. Apparently, this actually kills a lot of people um, every year. So it's, it's, this is a really real problem for, um, for healthcare organizations. So what I'm trying to do is, given a prescription, I know that the prescription will be associated with a drug, but the prescription doesn't matter because I haven't prescribed it yet, but that will be stored later when I do actually prescribe it. But I want to start at the patient, and I want to find any route from here through an allergy, right, as an outcome here, so you know, I, I can identify this allergy as being an important part of this traversal, to an ingredient that they are allergic to, and the drug is connected to the ingredient, right, because drugs are made up of ingredients, and they're allergic to some piece of the drug. So, like I said, this graph can be gigantic. I mean, there's all kinds of things hanging off, you know, all these, these data nodes here. It's, it's a really big graph of data. So, one thing you might like to be able to do is, is kind of filter this. Take a view of the data that only includes the relationships that you know are important for that traversal, right? So, essentially be able to do this, right? So, to take everything out and sort of break a clear path to the information you're actually looking for. And then a traversal comes very, becomes very easy to write. You basically say, okay, well, given this view of the data now, I'm looking for any way this patient is connected to this drug. Right? Because any way through this avenue that they're connected to this drug will be important because it will be through an allergy. Right? And so graph views that we're introducing, again, into graph three, allow you, and, and this happens at a very <coughs> level, to filter out all of the types of the database that don't make any sense for that particular database. And this is really, really powerful. And it's even more powerful than I've described here because we can also infer things. So even if this edge type was reused somewhere else and it led to some other different type, we can say, well, you know what, on the other, type, on the other side of that edge is this type that doesn't go anywhere in this view. And so we can optimize that out as well. So we can infer that going somewhere ahead of time won't go anywhere to our result. Um, and so we kind of compile the graph view before the navigation is run. Um, and it's, it's kind of hard to explain and get in your head, but this is an extremely, really powerful uh, <coughs> way to do traversals in a graph database. And so, you know, again, this is a, another you know, very interesting way to speed up, you know, to become a specialist in a certain type of data and speed up navigational queries. Um, and graph views, I think, are really powerful. And again, this is just an alternative example to say, well, you know, we're investigating positions, so we want to iterate across positions, and we want to see 
how, you know, maybe they're over-prescribing drugs, right? We want to see, you know, is there some kind of spike where somebody's just giving out this drug all the time for potentially no reason, right? So we can again do another view that cuts out all the other stuff from the position, you know, just it's the physician's relationship to the prescriptions and, and of course, ultimately to the drug. And we can plug the physicians in through an iterator and we can take the drug that we're targeting out and see how they connect and look at the counts for how many times it's prescribed. Very quick again. And then there's another side to this as well, and that is configured placement. And when I talk about placement, I talk about physically where data is stored in the database. So again, at the lowest level of how the database operates, being able to control physically how the data is stored. So, you know, I talked about that, you know, the graphs are a big mess, right? It's all over the place. Well, again, with Infinite Graph 3.0, we're giving you the ability to kind of give some hints and advice on how we should organize that graph to make it faster for sort of localized traversals. So for example, you know, I've given another healthcare example here, right? So you've got data that's usually always related to the patient, right? So the, the, the patient's visits, right, will be nodes in the graph potentially and there'll be relationships that point out to other parts of the graph and things like that. And you might want to do traversals. But if you've got a lot of queries that just sort of iterate around, you know, the patient's visits and things like that, it would be really nice if you could sort of hint to the database that these visits should really live with their patient, right? And so you give you a way to sort of you know, put them nearby. And this could end up on the same physical data pages that we read from the database, so therefore you get less page you know, faults and you, you, you're reading a much fewer number of pa uh, fewer pages to actually get the information back you want. And of course you can do the same thing with facilities. So you know, facilities have doctors, so maybe co-locating the doctors with the facilities and things like that. And we can do this in a declarative way. You don't have to actually, you know, put all of this sort of functionality into your code or into your data even. You don't have to, you know, model that specifically. We can actually create a model that's outside of the application and it will automatically do this kind of thing for you. Okay, so this is again a really, really powerful way because although this, I'm showing you kind of like, you know, what we're doing, but the, the, the effect is again faster reads for certain types of traversal and things like that. So I mean the, the effect of this is sort of dramatic. So how am I doing? Five minutes. So five minutes to whiz through the rest of these slides. Okay, so um, you know why Infinite Graph? Okay, so we've got um, Infinite Graph has been around for a couple of years, but you know the company objectivity has been building distributed databases for you know some number of years since since 93, so a, a very long time. We understand data, we've been doing it for a long time, we've got a very customer stable base, uh, stable customer base, sorry. Um, it's a complete DBMS, you know, we have transactions, I talked about you know having various transaction modes and having choices in, in that, but it's a complete you know database management system. It's not something that's writing into files and then hoping the best thing will happen, right? I mean, it's, it's a proper database. Um, so, and it's a specialist. I mean, you know, I've run through a few examples here. It's not a, you know, a graph layer on an RDBMS. It's a specialist database for storing graph database, uh, storing graph data. Um, so, I talked about some of these layers here. It's a fully distributed data model. You know, we have the concept of, you know, where data is stored physically you can configure outside of you know, the application, of course. The application just sees, hey, I want to put something in the database. We obviously have a distributed model which you can configure. You can add storage locations. We can even uh, define zones. So if you've got you know, pieces of data that you want to be stored in the same rack um, of machines, then you can you know, co-locate them in zones, things like that. Um, so, so what's a vertex? Sorry? So is there like a standard uh for the graph like vertex and stuff like More that. or less, yeah. I mean, some people call them nodes and you know edges, vertexes and edges, but same sort of. Is it standard across different uh, graph databases? The naming of them? I mean, the concepts are pretty much the same. Um, the names, uh, I'm not too sure. Various APIs, you know, will call them different things. We've got the Neo guy at the back of the room. <laughs> you call it node, right? Call it node. No, node, node in Neo. Vertex in the <laughs> but the, the concept is the same, you know, joining nodes with edges. And that's the 9% of the users using graph is called node. 9? 99. 99. Yeah, we're rebels, you know, we go against the, uh, the grain. How distributed do we say zones? You can talk about a rack or something like that. 
you do, you actually define it. Data centers, because you went around the world and said. Right, so you, do, you define what's in a zone. So you, you collect a group of hosts into a zone, you define that. So if it's in a rack or it's in a, you know, a physical location within a data center, that's up to you. Um, and you can define zones even you know, to a local machine. So you can say, here, this data really belongs, you know, and, and again, with infinite graphing, you can really store the data wherever you like. You know, it could be right up to the desktop if you really wanted to architect it that way. I mean, and you could have pieces of the graph stored up there. Um, and you can define that as a zone as well. What about on the iPad? iPad. <laughs> yeah, we get a lot of requests, but we don't. Usually iPads are, you know, are a client, but uh, not directly, no. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think I've been through this and I'm kind of running out of time. It's a super simple API. So, of course, it's a specialist, so, you know, the API looks like you're hooking up a graph. You're creating instances of vertexes or nodes in the graph, and you're hooking them up with edges. So, you can see this makes perfect sense. Um, you know, I talked about how, you know, it's tied to a schema, so your Java classes are mapped. Um, to types in the database, so it's very, you know, native for programmers to uh, to work with in the graph. Um, this is adding edges, of course. So you know, setting up a meeting, Alice at edge, end the meeting, makes sense. It just reads as it is. And of course, that's the result of the code we showed on the last couple of slides there. So I, I talked a little through traversals. You know, how how do you query a graph database? And I was talking about well, it's like this traversal, which is kind of like this trip that starts at some point, you know, which is your start node, so your origin here on this slide. And it goes out in the graph looking for whatever it's looking for, right? So that could be, you know, another node. So in the drug example I gave, you're starting at a patient and you're looking for a drug, right? And you're looking for it through these various types of relationships. That's one type of traversal. You might, it could be a fuzzy traversal as well. You might not know what you're looking for. So you might define predicates, like in a predicate query language, we have a query language which is based on predicates. So you can say, well, I'm looking for this kind of thing, and you know, here are some of the fields from that, and it might be a, you know, something Smith, you know, or something like that. So you can define that kind of thing as well. Um, and so, you know, there's lots of different types of, of navigational queries. Of course, you can define a strategy, breadth first or depth first. Um, the views I talked about in some detail there. You can also define qualifiers in code and compile them into the query as well. So you can say, you know what, I, I need to specify this very tightly. You know, I want to write a piece of code that qualifies the fact that this traversal is going well. Right? So along the way I can say, you know what, I've got to here, I'm looking back in the, the path how I got here, and this doesn't qualify, I want to get out, I want to bail out of this traversal. You can even go down to that level. So you can write very, very detailed queries into the, into the graph data. Uh, and of course, you know, result handlers, so we have a delicate base sort of result handler that pings results back to you. And in fact, this is something that people like. Um, we have a sort of an event-based, you know, you don't, when you perform a navigation in, in Infinite Graph, you don't say go and then wait for, for it to figure out what all the results are and then get them back as a result set. They actually fire them back to you as an event. So, if you get the first one and then your application is doing something on it and says, yeah, you know, that's what I need, and it can kill off the navigation, or you can wait, you know, and so you know, intelligent people like this, right? They've got massive data sets with all your information, all the phone calls you make, and they, they go off and they, um, they want to find something, and then the first thing they get back, they can go off and investigate, and they might be waiting for other things to come back, they go off and investigate. So it's, it's, it's really nice to have pieces of the, uh, the result coming back as they happen, as they're found. Um, we've got a visualizer tool, so you know, this is a really nice customizable sort of UI. So we can hook this up to any graph with your data and your data model in it, and you can customize the, the icons. And what you can do is you can build some of those traversals I was talking about, and you can load them up into this and execute them and look at the results. So you can, it's like a test. I mean, it's like the regular, with an RDMS, you've got like a little thing where you can test a SQL query. This is testing navigation, but it shows you the results as a, as a graph. So it shows you the start node and all the things that navigated to and how it got there. Nice little, uh, nice little thing. Um, so I can zip through the practical applications. I'm a little out of time. Of course, pathfinding is a big one. You know, intelligence use pathfinding a lot to sort of say, how is this person here we don't really know related to you know crime gangs and things that we already know about? Um, it's an obvious use case for the graph. We have some really good samples of this running out on our our booth out in the exhibit area. So you can go and look at some of these running. You can see how fast it does traversals and navigations into, uh, into large graphs. 
Um, algorithms on graphs, obviously, you know, degree centrality is, in, is interesting to some people to see, you know, who has the who is highest connected, so who has the most things connected to them, and obviously also things like you know, closeness and between is centrality, who is the middle of the graph, right? They're often the kingpins, right? So they're not having much communication, but everything goes through them. So it makes them suspicious in in crime networks and things like that. Um, of course, social networks, you know, to some extent are a graph problem, right? Because friends are connections to you and products that you bought are connections to you and things like that. So you've definitely got um, that in there. Um, business intelligence, you know, looking at ways that your processes are connected in a big graph and then sort of doing cause analysis and things like that. You can start at something happening and, you know, go and look at all of the, the outflow from that as a, as a graph. Um, very, really, you know, some really interesting use cases there. Um, you know, local crime, you know, intelligence, of course, is, is, is one of the biggest ones. Um, security, recognizing attack and threat patterns, you know, quite often that can be done with a graph. You can visualize the um, network data as, as a graph and you can look at uh, security from that perspective as well. Um, advertising is a really good one, you know, sort of seeing what people's browsing behavior is and connecting them into products and things like that. So when you want to place an ad, you just come in person mode, start looking around them for, you know, what things they've recently looked at or liked or whatever. It's, uh, it's a nice graph problem as well. And there's a bunch more. I talked about the healthcare. Obviously, you know, health sciences and genealogy and things like that are uh, also a big, uh, big use case. And uh, I guess I'm holding everybody back from lunch, so I won't go any further. <coughs> so if there's any questions, uh, you can come up and talk to me or I'll stay out and do a little bit um, as well. Or